Hello, um, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to this second event in the History Faculty's webinar series. Um, and this uh, is a new initiative inspired very much by the uh, extraordinary situation in which we find ourselves with COVID-19. And uh, it's the second event. Um, last week, Chris Clark, the Regis Professor, um, hosted a panel discussion. And today um, we're delighted to be able to share with you uh, some of the experiences associated with a major exhibition that the faculty collaborated with the Fitzwilliam Museum. Feast and Fast, the Art of Food in Europe, 1500 to 1800. And this ran from late last year and was brought to a slightly premature close by the COVID emergency. But Melissa Calaresu, who is the Neil McKendrick lecturer in history and a fellow of Gonville and Keyes College, uh, is with us today to discuss this, to talk about her, uh, the, her experiences of collaborating with the Fitz and to um, take us behind the scenes. So I'm going to turn over to her in a moment, but first of all, just a few um, uh, housekeeping uh, uh, notes. And the first is that this session is being recorded and will then be available online in the renewed uh, website of our faculty. Um, also, please note that your camera and microphone have been disabled, but you will be able to interact with both myself as the host, and I'll introduce myself in a moment, and uh, Melissa Calaresu through the question and answer button at the bottom of the screen. If you click on it, the question and answer window will pop up and then you can then insert your questions, which we will um, feed into the discussion uh, towards the end of this session. So I forgot I saw to uh, introduce myself. My name's Alex Walsham and I'm currently the chair of the faculty for my sins. Um, and I am myself an early modernist, uh, a historian, cultural historian, religious historian, of Britain in the 16th and 17th centuries. So I'm going to now hand over to um, Melissa uh, for her presentation before we move to conversation and questions. Okay, thanks very much, Alex. Um, really wonderful to be here today and talk about um, an exhibition that took a lot of time and was also um, a great pleasure for me to work on as a historian. Um, first of all, I'd like to say um, thanks to, um, to the Faculty of History for giving me this opportunity. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, this is going to be pretty packed in the 25 minutes that we've got. Uh, I'll try and take you through some of the um, main themes of the exhibition, but also something, I'll give you a little bit of a sense of what happened behind the, the scenes. Um, this project took about five years in the making. I was looking at some notes the other day and I have them from 2015, which is when we uh, just finished our Treasured Possessions exhibition. So that was the first of three collaborations between the Faculty of History and the Fitzwilliam Museum. And probably I really got started in 2016. And, and really from then on, it was um, a very kind of uh, labor intensive, but also amazing uh, project to be involved in. And I think before, I talk any further, I think I have to mention my co-curator uh, and friend, uh, Vicky Avery, um, who's on annual leave at the moment. She's a very ebullient person, if any of you know her, and really the super energetic one of the two of us. Um, and I'm sorry she's not here, so I'll try to make up for the enthusiasm that she normally puts into these um, lectures. We do them uh, together uh, quite often. In fact, um, we've done a number of them this year, and this one I think is probably the, my most nerve wracking one because I can't actually see any of you. So that's Victoria Avery. She's a keeper of applied arts um, at the Fitzwilliam Museum. And that's in fact the two of us in the exhibition, in the, in the second room of the exhibition. The first thing I'd like to say is that the Fitzwilliam Museum made this exhibition possible, not so only in terms of uh, creating, uh, uh, giving us the space to do the exhibition, but we 
um, particularly the early modernists in the faculty have had a long-standing collaboration with the museum and with applied arts in particular. In fact, this I think is um, Alex Walsham's special subject group. So it's a handling session. So very early on, way before 2015, um, many of the early modernists would go, go into the museum, go into applied arts and undergraduates and graduates would have a chance to handle a whole range of kinds of objects. And if any of you know the collection in the museum, it's a particularly rich collection in applied arts, in ceramics, in glass, in textiles, uh, in metalware as well. So we were able, really through the generosity of the museum and through Julia Poole, the former, former keeper of applied arts, and then Victoria Avery more recently, we've been able to come into the museum and really give students a chance to engage with these extraordinary and precious objects. And it really has changed not only um, our teaching practice, but I think also our research as well. We've become much more aware of questions about materiality and use. And these handling sessions were really essential for the undergraduate teaching, but also, as I say, for our research. So there are more than 300 objects in the uh, Feast and Fast exhibition. About 80% of them actually came from Fitzwilliam Reserves, uh, which is quite extraordinary. So we did have loans from other, um, other institutions, from other Cambridge colleges, from um, Wisbeach uh, and Fenland Museum, from Holcomb Estate, from the V&A, so a range of other collections, but really the core of the exhibition came from the Fitzwilliam. Um, it was a very hard uh, decision to, to, to decide on the 200 and some objects from the Fitzwilliam Museum. It took us a couple of years. Um, and in fact, the other day I was looking through an old uh, PowerPoint of all the rejected, it's called rejected objects. Um, and so it's a, in some ways another, another show entirely that we could have done. And here we are on the one hand, on the left with Julia Poole, as I said, former keeper and now honorary keeper of ceramics and, and Victoria Avery, who is the current keeper. And on the right, we're talking to a textile conservator. Sorry, just trying to get this to go. All of a sudden it's not working. There we go, sorry. Uh, and this is another uh, image of um, a handling session. In this case, it's a handling session um, with a community group. Um, people who are blind or partially sighted. Um, and there's a lot of ongoing work within the education department in the Fitzwilliam trying to engage with a diverse range of, of, of publics, um, trying to get them into the museum. And Victoria is particularly um, um, keen on bringing people into the applied arts, just as she was keen on bringing students in. And one of the things that came out of these sessions was really thinking about which objects we're going to choose, but also thinking about the multi-sensory multi uh, aspects of the objects we wanted to include in the exhibition as well. And that partly um, comes from uh, a current and ongoing interest in the senses in the cultural history of the early modern period. So after we had chosen the many objects and reduced them down to 200 and something, um, we had to find a narrative and of course we had a kind of narrative before we had the two themes of feasting and fasting so that kind of gave us if you want two bookends to the exhibition but within that we could really do anything and as I suggested before we could have actually done an entirely different kind of exhibition but this is what came of it partly a um, uh, result of my own interests in the ephemeral in um, selling food on the streets but also in Victoria's interests as well in art history, in the making of objects as well. So we were trying to combine a, a, a different number of, if you want, expertises, but also thinking also about what are current concerns in historiography, in history, in, in early modern history, but also some of the contemporary issues. We knew that this exhibition would have to have and would have a very big hug because people are interested in food. And there's so many contemporary issues now at the moment around, for instance, the production of food, labour, animal welfare. And so we try to embed some of these questions in the display of what are early modern objects and try and make them a little bit more accessible um, to, uh, to a wider, wider public. Um, as I said, Vicky is an art historian and we wanted to make sure that the art of food was also part of the exhibition so it wasn't just simply a kind of social history of food or a cultural history of food but to kind of engage also with some of the art historical aspects. These are three objects, probably some of my favourite objects in the exhibition. They represent uh, pomegranates in three different uh, contexts, one uh, 17th century China, one late 16th century Turkey and then finally an early 17th century English charger all representing pomegranates. 
putting these three objects together did a couple of things for us in the exhibition. One, it emphasized the extent to which this is a period of rapid globalization, but also the extent to which um, motifs traveled across time and across space in the early modern period, sometimes even maintaining their original meanings. The meaning, for instance, of the pomegranate in a Chinese context is not actually not so far from um, the meaning of a pomegranate on that 17th century charger. They're very much related. The pomegranate is very much related to questions about things like fertility, reproduction. And these objects were often objects um, for marriages to celebrate marriages. A second thing we were interested in doing in relation to the art of food was just to really put some emphasis on design on the materials. In this case, there is a, a drawing of a silver gilt ewer, but then this very beautiful uh, Limoges salt, and then finally this very beautiful glass uh, tatsa. So trying to get people to think a little bit about, um, about the material uh, in, in, of these objects and also the workmanship and design behind them. And then finally, a uh, third aspect of the art of food is just thinking about the labor, knowledge, skill required to make um, many of these uh, food um, displays in the early modern period. And I'm going to come back to this when I talk about the historical reconstructions from Ivan Day. But there is, for instance, very, very current now, an emphasis on the making of objects in the early modern period and how, to, how do we as historians recover um, the, the knowledge and skills required, in, in many cases not written down. And so that was the third aspect of the art of food. So the, for the rest of the talk, I want to divide it into two themes. One is about animal histories and the other one is about what I call labor histories. And so I'll have to talk about those two, two themes and try to relate them a little bit to current historiography. Um, as we probably are now more and more aware, the question about human animal relations is a very kind of important one at the moment in, the, in this period of, of pandemic. Um, and we had that already embedded before, uh, before March, uh, an interest um, in showing um, some of the discussions around um, animals and, and humans in the early modern period. So I think we're probably familiar with the idea of humans and animals living side by side by side. This image on the left by Tenye kind of shows that very clearly. This is a kind of back yard of an early modern house, possibly an urban house in, um, in um, the Dutch uh, provinces. And on the right hand side is half of this ceramic tile um, showing, if you can see just in the very middle of the right, on the very right hand side, a horse moving around in a mill. And that I think is a, probably a less familiar story. We know that humans live side by side. We know that humans had pets. Um, but what I think is probably less well known is the extent to which animals are working side by side um, with humans in this period in very urban contexts in some cases. And um, if you're more interested in that topic, there's a wonderful book um, by Tom Amrith Williams called City of Beasts, which is about animals in Georgian London in the 18th century, and I really recommend it. But it was important for us to, to talk about the, the role of animals um, in, 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 the production, in the production of food. But of course, that brings us to another question, which is about the hunting of animals and the eating of animals. And this is a very, very large painting, which is a studio copy after Franz Schneider's, and it's, uh, it's enormous. It's um, almost three meters, more than three meters wide. It's in one of the big rooms in the exhibition. And it has actually um, inspired a lot of, of, of emotion because it is in some ways a kind of real scene of, of death, of animal death and animal desolation. And it was an image I think was actually really important to talk about um, in February and early March when people were talking about the wet markets in China, that there is a tradition in Europe as well of eating of a whole range of kinds of wild animals. And I think that was one of the things that we wanted to remind uh, our public um, that there are there, there is a history of, um, of not, 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 not such a dissimilar history of the eating of wild animals. This of course is also in this case, this image is partly also about the display of wealth and the display also of the variety of the kinds of animals that you would be able to hunt, or more importantly to buy, more importantly to display on your, on your table. These are three images, uh, again, from the exhibition. I should say that all of the um, 
object numbers are Fitzwilliam numbers unless they're indicated otherwise. So all of all of these two of the two of the three objects in this slide are actually from the Fitzwilliam. The third is from the Wisbeach in Fenland Museum. But it shows you the variety of the ways in which animals are represented in this period. Um, reduced down to a, a kind of beak, beak marking in the left hand side, this really extraordinary swan register from Wisbeach, which shows the different markings of the different owners of swans. In the middle, a very, very angry duck. And on the very far right hand side, a favorite of Alex's, which is why I've included it, um, very small porcelain mouse. Um, all of these animals were part of uh, food production, or certainly didn't eat cats, but people were eating ducks and they were also eating swans. So it just gives you a sense of some of the kind of varieties also of the kinds of objects we had in the exhibition. Archival material, if you want, a drawing, and then this porcelain piece. Another aspect of um, thinking about animals and humans was to think about vegetables. And I think there's always an expectation that vegetarianism and an interest in veg vegetables is something that's more of a modern phenomenon. But in fact, that's not the case. So on the left hand side, I've got um, the, the title page of a book by John Evelyn called Acetaria, which includes a nine step uh, recipe for an oil and vinegar, vinegar recipe. Quite extraordinary. He, he clearly, um, Evelyn clearly learned about salads and about salad dressings when he went to Italy. And it's actually a book devoted to salads and devoted to vegetables, including a whole chart, which includes when vegetables are best eaten at certain times of the year. So even a very, very clear awareness also of seasonality. And on the right hand side is possibly one of the most beautiful paintings in the Fitzwilliam, a bundle of asparagus. And that is, it's, 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 it's a good point to think, you know, why is it that in this period, vegetables become so prominent? There's another image here, um, an image from Corpus Christi. Um, again, the real kind of pleasure and display of the variety of fresh vegetables. And on the right hand side, fresh, fresh fruits. Um, this is a period when, in fact, people are moving away from the salty, sweet and salty uh, cuisine of the Middle Ages to something uh, fresher, brighter, in which the taste of the asparagus comes out, the taste of the cauliflower comes out. And again, we presume that that kind of taste is something that's modern, but in fact, already in the early modern period, people are celebrating the really, you know, kind of unique tastes of, of a particular vegetable. And as I said, I think lots of our public, when they came through the exhibition, were surprised to know that vegetarianism actually has a much earlier history. Vegetarianism, of course, is embed in, already embedded in, um, in Lent and eating. That is, the, you know, what kinds of things people are eating during Lent. That is not meat and quite often not dairy products. There is, in fact, an early history of veganism in which things like almond milk replace dairy milk. And you see that in recipe books from this period. Thomas Tryon is probably one of the best known, if you want, vegetarian writers um, of the early modern period. His reasons are mostly religious, but he also makes an argument for not eating animals uh, on health reasons and even on animal welfare reasons as well. So he often comes up in, in more recent histories of vegetarianism. I think this is one of the, possibly one of the most surprising themes for the public as they went through the exhibition was to find this early history of vegetarianism. I now want to go on to the second uh, theme, which is the histories of labor, or histories of work or labor histories. This is an image uh, from the Birm from Birmingham Museum, and it shows a woman, if you can see it at the very center, she's got a lot of uh, hair in her hands and she's larding it. That is, she's actually sewing in small um, pieces of lard to make the hair. Um, a little bit moisture when it gets cooked on the fire. And you can see the edges of the fire just in the very, very far left-hand corner of the, um, of the painting and the spit jack there as well, which would have turned the hair around. And it's important to remember that behind food making in, in this period is in fact a lot of labor, often gendered labor, a lot of women in the kitchen clearly, clearly shown here, a lot of anonymous labor and a lot of labor which is not necessarily a skill which is not necessarily recorded in uh, recipe books in this period. This is a really unusual image. It comes from the Royal College of Physicians and it's um, um, a book, in this case, ab about kind of table, um, okay, table, table designs, about carving of meat and things like that. And it's quite extraordinary that the, the intricacy of these diagrams, these are uh, diagrams for showing how to fold napkins. 
one of the things that I'll show you in the historical reconstructions is that what is left of food history in museums is in fact not um, not just the the bowls or the serving plates, but there is in fact sugar sculptures, napkins, and we're trying to recreate create that in these historical reconstructions in, in this way, showing kind of much fuller sense of what the table might have looked at in the early modern period. And this is in fact one of the reconstructions by Ivan Day, um, one of three in the exhibition, um, and I'll show you some other pictures of, there he is um, working away, setting up, this is for the photography session, and he had made all these things, usually with his own moulds, he makes his own moulds and then makes them um, into these um, extraordinary historical displays, very much embedded in his own research. Um, and so if you're going to talk about sugar in the early modern period, you cannot but not talk about uh, enslavement of peoples, uh, African peoples in particular. Um, and we tried to find a way of doing this in the exhibition. I think this is an important uh, historical question, but also I think a contemporary question as well. Um, we had um, some images, in this case, of enslaved Africans in a sugar mill. Uh, and we tried to uh, communicate to the public just the extent to which how hard this work is, was, um, and also the, 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 if you want, the system behind what was this extraordinary consumption, rise in the consumption of sugar in this period, and behind it was this history of, of slavery. Um, that's not to say that there were um, uh, not discussions about slavery in the 18th and 19th century, there certainly were, and there were attempts at trying to make consumers aware, not unlike today, consumers aware, of the conditions in which food was produced. And I've just put on the right hand side the book cover of a, a forthcoming book by my colleague at Keyes, Bronwyn Everill. Um, that I think it's coming out actually sooner than September, I think sometime in August, not my, made by slaves, ethical capitalism in the age of abolition. So you can read more about some of these if you want ethical um, consumer movements. And then finally on slavery, um, one of the documents in the exhibition, it's a document um, from, uh, of, a, of a letter sent to a slave owner in, in, in England outlining the names and values of uh, men and women that had been uh, bought, by him in a, in, uh, bought by him in 1797. Um, their names, they're without last names. Um, and um, it's, it does give a sense of, um, well, the system, of, of slavery as a financial system. And what's of course lost are the voices of these enslaved peoples. And as you, many of you must know, one of the things that Cambridge is trying to address now is really the legacies of slavery, it, slavery in the university. This letter has nothing to do with Cambridge. It's, it's being kept at St. John's Library. It was bought relatively recently, but it's one thing that we as historians are trying to do in Cambridge at the moment is to really think about the legacies of slavery um, in, in the university. So finally, I'll just spend the last few minutes um, just talking about public impact. I think we as historians have to think about publics and about political debates. I think that not, we can't really do history without thinking about the politics of what we're doing. Um, and so the public aspect of this exhibition was very important to all of us and of course important to the museum as well. And this is the most obvious sign of the public impact, which is this big bright pineapple that actually still is staying outside of Fitzwilliam in the front lawn. Um, by Bompas and Parr. There was something kind of on the more local level, Fitzbillies, that many of you may, may remember, uh, had a special display, it's sort of in honor of the exhibition. And on the right-hand side, Vandalile, which is a new restaurant in Cambridge, did this extraordinary photograph of, um, after the Riesbrick painting I showed you before. In the exhibition and part of kind of new museum practice, we actually incorporated a creative and reflective zone at the very end of the exhibition space. It was actually part of the exhibition. In fact, there were exhibits as you moved into this final room. It was a chance for uh, visitors to watch this film, as you can see in the background here, to give feedback, but also to do, you know, there's lots of art, um, sub um, uh, materials and things like that, so people could actually sort of create in response. And um, here's some examples of sort of smaller and um, uh, other people uh, painting and drawing in response to the exhibition. Exhibitions are concerned, museum exhibitions are concerned about getting feedback and they're always, almost always done through words, through questionnaires, but we were keen to also get visual responses 
to the exhibition. Here are some of them here. People would uh, write, draw, paint, whatever, uh, and then leave these for us. Um, and a real pleasure, and we'd collect them every couple of days, and we hope to be able to analyze them alongside the word-based questionnaires that we've received as well. There was an extensive uh, program of kind of public engagement events. This is um, an example of some historians, some undergraduate historians and some Kians actually, with uh, Chris Kassan in the, in the middle, who's an Irish uh, historian, Irish food historian, and Vicky and, and me there as well. Um, and it's just one of the many events we put on um, in, uh, during the run of the exhibition until it closed in the middle of March. And probably our biggest and probably most important output in many ways are two films that we co-produced with three community groups in Cambridge. And I really recommend that you go on the FITS website to see, um, see the two films, extraordinarily moving, but it gives you really a sense of the extent to which they, these groups were involved in the selection of objects, but also later in various kinds of educational activities we did with them. And you can see on the right hand side, um, one of the um, uh, Egg and Spoon filmmakers. And finally, there, not surprisingly, there's a, a website that came out of this exhibition, a public conference on the pineapple. Um, this beautiful exhibition catalogue, which in, in which a whole number of uh, colleagues in Cambridge contributed to. Uh, it's very much a collaborative effort and also a special issue of the Journal of Early Modern History, to which both Helen Pfeiffer and Alex Walsh contribute, contributed to. So um, wonderful chance to bring together all this expertise, early modern expertise in the production of these um, other sorts of, if you want, outputs from the exhibition. And then finally, just to end, to say um, the, ex the museum is reopening and the exhibition will be reopening as well. So I know that some of you missed it. So there is a chance, it's not set up yet, the booking system is not set up yet, but please look over the next couple of weeks, there will be a book booking system in place and you should be able to uh, book a place to see a Feast and Fast up to the 31st of August. So thank you. Hello, great. Thank you so much, Melissa. That was um, fascinating and really reminded me what just what a spectacular exhibition this was. And I very much hope that uh, those of you who are listening will take the opportunity to, to book a place to see to see it again in the flesh. So we, I'm just going to ask you to begin to send in your questions through the question and answer um, facility, um, but I'm going to start a conversation with Melissa about um, about her talk and about some of the issues that it it raises. So Melissa, this is uh, one of three really um, fantastic collaborations between the Fitzwilliam and the history faculty, and I wondered if you might start by telling us what you think you learned most from collaborating with um, curators. Uh, people at the front line of presenting um, object histories to uh, the public? Um, thanks, that's a good question. Um, I don't, I mean, think the very first thing to say is that this would not have been possible without um, Vicki Avery, who we both know. Um, she's a extraordinary colleague and a great collaborator. Um, I think she brought into it a sense, I mean, she is an art historian, so there was a, a lot of uh, discussion about um, some of the objects which she liked and didn't like partly. I mean, I like them as historical objects, but they weren't great for display. <laughs> so they were broken or, you know, they weren't particularly good quality. So it was kind of interesting to have to negotiate with her. I mean, she was pretty um, generous, uh, to be honest, but that I think was, um, the thing I've, I've learned from her is just kind of having to negotiate about these kinds of objects and make sure that a good story can be told, right? I mean, that's a really important part of the exhibition. And then I think more broadly, I've, I've learned um, what impact really means, right? And what publics really mean. I think that as academics, we, we do try and engage with wider publics, but museums do that day to day. And they do with a whole range of kinds of people, the kinds of people that we don't engage with, like toddlers and babies, for instance, right? Um, so I think just the energy and expertise and skill involved with engaging with a variety of publics from a whole, you know, different walks of life. And so I think that's probably the one thing that I've learned, um, learned most about, actually, in this, particularly in this last exhibition. I've been much more involved with public pro programming than I was with Treasured Possessions. Right, great. 
just following on from that, um, what do you think this experience has done in terms of transforming how you do your own research? And it's important to underline that Melissa is an eminent uh, food historian. Uh, what have you learned from, um, from this experience of the exhibition uh, that's changed the way you do your, your own work? Um, well, cut to the quick, <laughs> I think is actually one of the things that we all have to learn how to do, you know, not to spend too much of the time in the detail. Um, I think the, um, the handling sessions, so this is a much longer history really, is those handling sessions really transform the way I work as a historian. I mean, I started off as a historian really in 2D. I mean, it, I was an intellectual historian and the sort of material world of the people and places that I looked at wasn't really present. And I think now they're very much there. In fact, possibly I've gone to the other side, which is the kind of material world has become much stronger in my, my account, for instance, of the city of Naples than they would have been 20 years ago. So I think it's not so much the exhibition, but probably the handling sessions, which are part of, you know, part of our teaching practice and have become very much part of, you know, how I do my research now. Right. Right. Yeah. I mean, I was very struck by watching your slides and seeing the exhibition by just how sensual uh, these objects and paintings and images are. And they evoke senses and emotions. And putting that together with the work that you did with visually impaired and blind um, people, can you talk a little bit about how they responded to what we see as a visual feast how did they respond to the objects they were touching and feeling and how what experience did they get from food of, about food from that gosh i mean um it did make you think about how you touch an object and the kind of detail you know of, of any of these objects and the weight of them um and the way in which bodies move around objects as well so i think that's something we probably learned from a range of community groups coming in um and i guess the other thing and this is not so much in terms of senses but i think with the younger like the um school sort of school age kids it's just how strange some of these objects are and how their practices are so far away from what they understand. So it was, I think, maybe learning about how to try and explain why, what this honeypot is, you know, why it looks a bit like Winnie the Pooh's honeypot, but no one sees a honeypot like that anymore. So I think just like how strange a lot of the objects are and how our job really is to try and make them comprehensible, understandable. Um, and the handling session really does that. It really gets people to engage with the object, do its size, its weight, as they say, yeah. um, what's around it, you know, what the kind of visual stuff. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Um, you mentioned earlier on that you had a reject list. Um, yeah. So what among those ones that you couldn't include would you most like to have included? Oh my gosh. Okay. Well, there are two. <laughs> two. Uh, yeah, there are two. Um, so I really wanted to have, I'm just going to put this up because I've been instructed to do so, but I'll just put it up so we've got it in the background. Um, sorry. There. Can you see that? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I, probably the thing that I really wanted to include was a case of sauce boats. Um, so, you know, there's an extraordinary variety of sauce boats in there, or sauce boats, I think they probably call them in, in Britain, in the Fitzwilliam. Most of them were collected by Glacier, who was a great collector of ceramics in the late 19th and early 20th century. And he had such a kind of great eye for really interesting objects. and. I imagined a kind of case full of sauce boats and to talk about, you know, sauces and on the early modern table in the 18th century, it's really an 18th century phenomenon. So that would be, that's a whole case gone. And I think Vicky took it out one weekend when I wasn't looking. And so <laughs> we did a lot of cutting. And then the other thing would be um, a case devoted to the Ottoman world. I think that's the other thing I wish that I had included. And, in one of the photographs with Poppy Singer, you can see us looking at a 19th century, century Ottoman textile with these extraordinary images of cut melons at the bottom. And there just wasn't enough in the, in the museum that would have allowed us to 
done well uh, a case devoted to early modern Ottoman food and Ottoman dining. I mean, we did, one of the good things that came out of our Journal of Early Modern History special issues, you know, is that Helen Pfeiffer wrote a, an article about Ottoman dining, which actually run, won, a, won a prize recently, um, got a commendation from the Sophie Co prize panel. And I'm glad that that was one of the results because I had really wanted to include the Ottomans, but it just wasn't enough space. And as I say, the quality of the material wasn't good enough for us to do something that really kind of interesting with it. Mm -hmm. So uh, among the objects that you did include, uh, can, you, can you identify a favourite? Hmm. Um, I love that painting of the asparagus, the way it kind of hangs on the edge of a table and looks like it's going to fall off. And I think asparagus must be difficult to draw because not everyone gets it very right, including that painter. Um, I think it must be difficult to draw like hands or something. Um, probably that painting and then a little uh, dish it's a bit broken it's the kind of thing actually that um, early like social historians would love but I think art historians don't love so much and it's a broken fasting bowl it says um, um, pray and fast on it and it's really evocative and it's still got some of the burnishing on the bottom of the of the of the pot so it would have probably been used I imagine for some sort of vegetable soup some sort of Lenten fare and it just does really evoke you know, use and period, long periods of time in the, in the year where people were actually eating no meat um, and, you know, reflecting and praying uh, during the Lenten period. Yeah. Brilliant. We're starting to get a lot of questions now, but I do want to, to ask one last question before we to hand over to those who are participating. And that is um, at the very heart of this um, exhibition is a pineapple. It's on your um, it's outside the Fitzwilliam. It's on the, uh, the first slide of your presentation. So tell us in, in about two sentences, the history of the pineapple. Um, well, uh, the history of the pineapple. Um, it was discovered in the New World and quotation marks discovered. Um, and it's for one of its first descriptions uh, followed the description of a rape of indigenous woman. So its history is silent. Um, uh, it uh, has a particular history in Cambridge uh, because Fitzwilliam's um, grandfather had an image of a painting of, the, of, of a pineapple done, uh, painted in the early 18th century and that actually is in the exhibition. The other connection to Cambridge and the pineapple is that the first professor of botany uh, published the first cake recipe using pineapples. Um, uh, but pineapples is a, actually a wonderful way of thinking about globalization, actually, from its early origins, so to speak, or early discovery, through to the 20th, 21st century, when we can buy a pineapple for a pound. And what does that mean about the labor conditions behind the production of pineapples? Great, fantastic. Well, I'm going to start now uh, with the questions that are coming in. Okay. And, and one, two, two uh, particular participants have asked, Fernanda and David, have asked about whether uh, this involved, this exhibition involved the opportunity to explore recipes of the early modern period, to think about how um, food was cooked and whether you did any cooking as part of the preparations for this exhibition. I'm not a great, I mean, I love cooking, but I don't cook early modern recipes because I don't know if we've ever had any of these early modern recipes, but they're usually not very good. <laughs> I've spent a lot of time looking at recipe books, a lot. Um, and I mean, I think one of the things that's interesting about recipe books in the early modern period, as you know, well, is that actually a lot of the instructions are not there. There's a lot of like um, knowledge that's actually not written down. And so the recipe books weren't necessarily meant for people actually making the recipes. So recipe books as a kind of way to recreate historical food is probably not the best way. And that's really the great sort of contribution of someone like Ivan Day, because he's done a lot of this historical reconstruction using contemporary utensils. He has this extraordinary collection in Sharp in Cumbria of early modern utensils through which he tries to replicate some of these historical recipes. So I would say Ivan, absolutely, that's what he does sort of day to day. Mm -hmm. um, I think I spend more, more of my time kind of going through, going through recipe books rather than actually um, making recipes from them. Mm -hmm. Great, great. And did you did you like the food that you've had from early modern recipes? Was it tasty? <laughs> um, Ivan's a great cook, so any food I've had there, he you know I'm happy to eat. Um, I've had some some pretty bad 
biscuits that have been brought to various conferences that people use as early modern recipes. They've got like lard in them and they're always really hard. And so I, I'm not a great uh, sort of advocate for early modern uh, cooking. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so um, Emma, one of our participants has asked a question that picks up on a point that you made earlier, which was about that you were once really a historian in two dimensions mm -hmm. and you're now very much working in, in three dimensions. What different kind of issues does that raise um, uh, for you as a historian? What have you learned from that? Um, so I think that when I started off as an intellectual historian, it was absolutely tech-centered and the, they were all men. The men who were writing were present, but their life cycle wasn't present, no, nor was their sense of urban space. And I'll give you an example. I heard a talk recently um, by someone who was writing, uh, doing a kind of intellectual history of plantain, plantation owners in the French Caribbean. And it was simply an intellectual history. It was the history that I would have done 25 years ago. Um, and there was no sense of the like, heat outside or the slaves in the, in the house or the slaves outside. There was no sense of the kind of material aspects in which this person working in the French Caribbean was, was, was you know, writing about Rousseau, for instance. And I think that we do need to think about the sort of material aspects of, if you're an intellectual historian of the writers or the material aspects of what it's like to move around a city. Where's the light? Where's the dark? Where, you know, what, what happens between morning and night in a particular place? And so I think much more of this sort of ephemeral time-based space-based materials become much more of the way I, I, I look at anything now, any kind of um, source. Yeah. I guess there's a particular uh, further dimension of that, and that is that historians for some time have sort of embraced the visual, mm -hmm. uh, but they're now embracing the material. So what's the difference between uh, the material uh, versus the visual as, as, a, as a route into, into the past? compared with texts? Yeah, I mean, you know, you're asking me, Alex, that's, <laughs> I'm sure you could answer the question as well, <laughs> or some, many of our colleagues. Um, I think that the visual and the material both require expertise, um, and we do need to rely on our colleagues in museums and art historians. I think that's important. But I think as material culture historians, if that's what you, you know, could mm -hmm. call me, um, I think it's actually going beyond necessarily the kinds of objects that you find in museums. In a lot of cases, it's not even anything that survives, you know, for instance, the string around um, something that puts a uh, kind of, you know, vellum lid on a honeypot, for instance. So it's not even those things that survive, but it's also about trying to recreate and reconstruct and find all the, sort of, the, the, full, the fullness of the material world in the early modern period. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the other participants is raised a question about how far, uh, in a way, this project of yours and, and wider trends in the field uh, reconstitutes and redefines our sense of what an archive is. If an archive is no longer documents, mm -hmm. but objects, um, how does that change what we do? Um, well, it certainly complicates things. I mean, as we both know, there's objects in archives, um, you know, in boxes and things like that. So archives do have objects. And of course, archives always had objects, objects in them. Um, it means going to more places and learning more, I think really learning more fields. You know, I think that we, we need, I, you know, I needed to learn about how you make porcelain, for instance, or what's the difference between earthenware and porcelain. So I think we've had to learn more about ways and things objects are produced. I mean, you know, we weren't so concerned about how you make paper, how we make ink, but I think that's also something to think about but also um, making friends with museums, going into collections, uh, negotiating, you know, handling sessions, that that's really what, how my sort of practice as a historian has changed, that when I go to do archival work, I go to the archives, but I also visit museums as well. Okay, so uh, now we have a question from Gabriella, who would like to hear more about food taboos in early modern Europe. Oh my gosh, food taboos. Gosh, I don't really know anything about food taboos. I don't, I don't dare even talk about that. Um, yeah, I mean, there, you know, there is food taboos around particular religious practices and so not eating of pork, for instance. Um, but um, 
they ate a lot of different things in the early modern period. I mean, in Rome in the 17th century, they're eating things that we wouldn't dare eat. Um, you know, um, and I, so, I, you know, well, I, maybe we would eat frogs, but I mean, a whole range of kinds of small little songbirds. I mean, that's a taboo for us. I don't think it was a taboo for the early modern period. So I think one of the things you have to do as a historian is also recognize really the variety of kinds of things that people are eating, which as I say, we wouldn't eat today. The songbirds are particularly disturbing. You see them in that Snyder's painting as well. And you think, gosh, did they really eat those things? And yeah, they're there in all of the, you know, the recipe books. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, uh, you know, the Jewish experience is very much part of the exhibition too. Um, right. And that's important to point that out. Yeah. Okay, we have now a question from Sally, who would like to ask about, has there been a social division in cooking? Uh, when the upper classes had cooks, um, is it the case that they were not interested in cooking themselves? Or is there a parallel to the, the phenomenon we have now where, you know, cooking uh, and master chef and all of this is very much a very fashionable and uh, popular activity. So um, elites in early modern period were concerned about food, probably not so much in the preparation, but certainly in the display, what was chosen for a menu. So any kind of good mistress in the early modern period, many of the recipe books and books about the serving uh, banquets, for instance, were actually targeted for the, precisely that audience. So they themselves might have not been doing the work behind like the sugar sculptures, but they certainly would have been directing it, mm -hmm. thinking about what was best um, to show the kind of, you know, most beautiful uh, table possible. So I think people were absolutely concerned, but it was more about, you know, how you, how you displayed yourself, how you displayed your table in the early modern period. Yeah, great. Okay, well, the last question is from Stefano. Uh, who is interested in the, the points you were raising earlier about the human animal divide. Mm -hmm. uh, how does food making help to define that divide between the human and the non-human? Gosh, well, that is definitely a question for my colleague, Sujit Sivasindram, who's just written an article for Past and Present on the, on the pangolin. Um, and I think that's something that is hard for us when we go into the exhibition to kind of recognize. I think first I was, I was truly struck by the extent to which animals are part of the urban life um, by reading the book by Amrith Williams. But um, I think that dividing line is, is not so clear in lots of those images. The Snyder's one is, is a good example, but the pain of that duck, mm -hmm. I don't understand why, yeah. what, what's the beauty in that, in that, in that drawing. And it's hard for us to understand what it could possibly have, have meant. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, it's, I guess, one of the things that is, is you know, that, that we're different, right? Or that there are, there are clear differences and it's hard to kind of um, understand in, in, in these, you know, our people's relationship to animals in this historical context. Okay, we, we have two uh, more quick questions and I think I'm going to combine them and then that will have to be the end before we draw to a close. Mm -hmm. So the first question is from Nishant who asks about food allergies and intolerances. Mm -hmm. Is this uh, a modern phenomenon or does it have precedence in, in the period we're talking about? And then Carmel uh, would like to ask about uh, more to set you to say a bit more about the role of slaves in the preparation of food. Okay, um, I'm not an expert in either of those, so for allergies, I don't really, I don't have a, a sense of that at all. I knew that there are very clear prohibitions around eating food at certain times of the year, so in the Christian calendar, but also in the Jewish calendar, um, and um, uh, it's quite extraordinary the lengths to which people go to avoid meat, um, including having whole banquets made out of vegetables and fish in, during a Lenten period to make them look like, you know, meat cutlets, for instance. There's an extraordinary amount of effort behind dissimulating meat, the kind of food that you would normally eat outside of Lent during a Lenten period. And then in terms of slaves preparing food, again, I'm not really an expert on, on this and this at all. Um, uh, I, I had hoped to include in the exhibition uh, an image um, based on what I know about um, early, er, about rice production in the New World and New England, in sort of parts of uh, 
new world. Um, and a place like North Carolina, for instance, has made a, had a very important kind of industry of, of rice production. This I got from Lizzie Collin, Collingham's book on the Hungry Empire. And it's clear that the knowledge around rice production came from enslaved Africans. Mm -hmm. There was clearly this kind of knowledge uh, that moved from Africa to the new world with the slaves, enslaved peoples, um, and actually contributed to, uh, you know, this quite important kind of rice production in, in North Carolina. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Well, unfortunately, we're going to have to start drawing to a close now. Um, but it's been a fantastic session. And um, thank you, Melissa, very much for your really stimulating um, uh, presentation, which I'm sure has whetted people's appetite to sign up for some of the tickets uh, for the, re the reopened exhibition. Um, but I'd also like to thank those of you who've joined us this afternoon um, and for all your stimulating questions. And we hope that you'll want to participate in future events of this kind that the faculty um, organises. And in that vein, um, just to say, uh, don't forget that there's still time to register for um, a third event in our series of webinars. And this will be um, a virtual tour of uh, the University Library's recent exhibition, uh, The Rising Tide. And this will be hosted by the University Librarian, um, Jessica Gardner, and will involve our colleagues, um, Lucy Delap and Ben Griffin, who were the curators of that um, uh, excellent exhibition. That will be next Thursday um, uh, on the 30th of July at 1 p.m. And um, I think details have been sent to you about how to do that. But all that remains is for me to thank you once again for joining us, um, to hope that uh, you'll continue to engage in our um, events. And uh, please do send us feedback, uh, suggestions uh, and ask questions. I'm sure Melissa will be more than happy to respond to further questions that you might have about the exhibition. Anyway, all the very best and um, good afternoon.